So welcome back, everybody. Um, in this recording, I want to talk about um, Lorraine Code's article, Is the Sex of the Knower Epistemologically Significant? So what we want to talk about today is a view of epistemology that's slightly different than the theories that we've looked at so far. So in our previous lectures, we've looked at Descartes' theory, which is mind-dependent. So we can have knowledge by reflecting on the operation of our mind. And that's the, the true source of knowledge, right? That's where we get to the cogito. We've got Locke and Locke's empiricism, which says that all knowledge really comes from experience. Although our mind can manipulate things and ideas and so forth to make connections, it's really the external world that provides us with all the information. So there's these ideas, and then the ideas sort of come to us in our mind, and our mind does things with those ideas. Immanuel Kant takes both the rationalist and empiricist traditions in a way and says, look, our mind is actually an active participant in the ideas that we reflect on and the knowledge that we gain. So it's not just raw sense experience that gives me ideas and then my mind manipulates them. It's sense experience filtered through um, certain categories of our understanding, right? These filters like space and time and extension are things that we sort of place onto our experiences. So that changes where knowledge comes from, right? Knowledge has this subjective element, even though Kant says, for example, that there is something out there. It just so knowledge starts in experience, it doesn't just end there. Code's article is a little bit different. Code is asking whether or not there's actually something unique about the sex of the knower that would influence what we call knowledge. So remember with Kant again, the individual is an active participant in forming the ideas that we have, right? We're, it's part of, part of our experience, part of our knowledge comes from these subjective elements added. So in one way, code can be, as an ex it can be seen as an extension of a Kantian sort of idea. Right? The idea is that, well, wait a minute, if, if our mind is adding things to our experience, if it's doing some work in the acquisition of knowledge, does it matter whether that mind is the mind of a man or a mind of a woman, right? Does the sex of the knower actually matter? So this is where we're going to use as a jumping off point for code and see what she's actually trying to um, say in her article. So let's start with a couple of assumptions. So code initially starts with what are the things that we generally think about in epistemology, right? What have we thought about in the previous philosophers that we've looked at? So one, the sort of common idea of knowledge is S knows that P, right? Our common notion of what it means is there's some subject that knows something, right? This is the sort of standard framework for knowledge. In traditional theories, who the S is is completely irrelevant, right? Doesn't matter whether they're male or female, young or old, to say that S knows that P, it really doesn't matter who S is because after all, knowledge is some sort of grounded thing. When I say I know something, it's not to say something that I guess something's true or I think it might be the case or maybe it's true of the world. But to say that S knows that P is to say that there's something permanent or objective, ahistorical, or is comes about by some neutral framework or standard. So you can think of science as an example, right? So repeated testing of something says that S now knows that P in virtue of applying these tests over and over again. So there might be some framework, or maybe it's just an empirical framework, right? Maybe it's just saying, well, look, we trust when someone says it's raining outside or it's snowing outside or one of those things. How do I know that's the case? Well, I observe it, right? So there's observation, normal functioning of the eyes, we go to a window and assuming the window is clear and I can see out and all these other things when we build sort of these framework or standards of knowledge and then say, ah, yes, I've experienced that it is in fact raining outside or it's not raining. So S knows that P, whatever P happens to be in this case, that the weather is a, is a certain way. So code says this is our standard assumptions about knowledge claims, right? It seems to be irrelevant who's doing the knowing. And what she wants to say is that maybe that's not actually the case, that there are situations, there is a way of looking at epistemology, at knowledge claims, such that it actually does matter who S is when we're talking about S knows that P. So who is S? This is a sort of question. 
does S's identity matter in the acquisition of knowledge? So to say that that would be the case, that actually who S is matters, would be, say, would be to sort of answer the question, does some characteristic about S matter when it comes to knowledge claims, right? So in that instance, in an instance where we say this characteristic matters, then there's an additional question that's raised that doesn't this lead to a kind of relativism? So let me take a step back. So we can think that certain characteristics about people do matter in the acquisition of knowledge. So if somebody is blind and makes a claim about a color of some object in the world, we might say that that characteristic is obviously relevant. If that person can't see or can't see, can't see well, then we've got a problem, right? We could question that knowledge claim. Similarly with somebody who doesn't hear particularly well or any other sense that might be diminished for one reason or another. Same thing when we talk about people who may, for example, be under the influence of drugs or alcohol or somebody who might have a high fever, as I've mentioned in other examples. So in all these things, these, certain, these characteristics may matter, but normally those characteristics don't matter when it comes to the sex of the knower. Now, if we were to allow that all those other things being equal, so in other words, normal human being with senses that are working properly, wouldn't that mean that if the sex of the knower matter, wouldn't it lead to a kind of relativism, right, where truth is actually relative to each individual? Now, we don't normally want that to be the case, right? We think knowledge, if we go back to the previous sort of criteria, we think knowledge is something objective, and it's not historical, it's permanent, right? It's not something that changes when some other person comes in. That's not what we mean when we make a knowledge claim. When I say it's raining outside, I don't say it's raining outside for me. I mean it's raining outside as a fact about the world that applies to everyone, regardless of who's doing the observation. So code wants to take on the question of, is relativism a bad thing? And does her theory lead us to a form of relativism? So here's some of the concerns that we have, we might have with relativism, right? So one is an incommensurability of knowledge claims. In other words, we couldn't have two claims that were um, able to be reconciled, right? When two things are so different. So knowledge claims would be incommensurable and in that they, other, they couldn't be compared, they couldn't, be, um, they couldn't exist at the same time because it would just be too different, like in this, the picture we have here of comparing apples to oranges. So if all knowledge is relative, then there's really no way of comparing one claim against another, right? So we lose this idea of, of truth. Another problem is that knowledge itself seems to become meaningless, right? We get into a sort of radical view of, of subjectivism where all knowledge is purely subjective. It's just what I believe is true or false. Now, again, that's kind of a silly position, right? So most philosophers, most people in general would say, look, the fact that you believe something doesn't tell me anything about whether it's true or not, right? So there are people who believe the earth is flat. The fact that someone believes the earth is flat doesn't make it true, right? And we don't want to say that, well, knowledge just merits just whatever you think. If that were the case, then it would, in fact, become meaningless. And relativism, relativism about knowledge is, in fact, self-defeating, because even the claim that there's not knowledge would be a claim that I couldn't back up with anything, right? Or the claim that all knowledge is relative is itself a relative claim, which would be sort of self-defeating, right? It's almost self-contradictory. So there's all these kind of concerns with relativism, and I think a lot of us are concerned. Now, we tend to be more concerned about relativism, I think, because of its prevalence in things like ethics, right? When people make statements, well, that's just what I believe. But I think the same sort of concerns can come from uh, epistemological relativism as well, right? We do want to say there are truths in the world, right? There are things that are subjective. There are things that are open to interpretation, but also there are things that not. So if you or I are on a boat, and I say, look, you have to turn the boat, right? We're going to crash on those rocks. And those, the rocks, they're, they're 30 yards away. Now, if all knowledge is relative, then you say, well, look, I don't believe those rocks are 30 yards away. You know, maybe Now, we could disagree, for example, about whether it's 20 yards or 30 yards or whether our, you know, whether our ability to judge distance is off. We could also argue about you know, what do we mean by yard. 
So we've got an agreed. So assuming we've got an agreed upon notion of distance, and assuming that we're relatively close in our estimation, the fact that there are rocks there means that even if you don't believe we're going to crash on those rocks, if our boat is heading towards them and there's nothing to stop it, we're going to crash. That's that's a fact of the matter. So knowledge claims that are relative would lead to a really strange world that we would live in, right? And so relativism is sort of concerning to philosophers, and I think it's concerning to all of us, that there are times we want to say, look, there are some things that are just facts of the matter. And if we can't agree on that, then I think we're in trouble. Now, our code wants to note that there are disadvantages to relativism, and I've just talked about these disadvantages to relativism. There also are some advantages, though. Right? Not all notions of relativism or allowing that relativism has some interesting insights about knowledge um, makes relativism necessarily always bad. So one of the things that acknowledging relativism is that it avoids oversimplified paradigms of knowledge. Right? To say that um, knowledge claims are simply brute observations that don't have um, any context is one of the advantages of relativism. So for example, we could have relativism about what it means to make a decent living, right? Now there might be standards we could all come to agree upon that says, well, look, below a certain level of existence, right? Having enough food and clothing, shelter and heat and what other things we might, we can debate what those things are. So we might come to some sort of conclusion, but for someone just to say, well, because I'm okay, then everyone else must be okay. Well, no, that might not be the case, right? It might be oversimplifying it because your position might not take into account, well, what is the cost of living or what is inflation or the gasoline prices that are rising, you know, right now at the time that we're record that I'm recording this, we're seeing a huge upsurge in gasoline. And while some of them might say, well, look, you know, it's only, you know, what is it in a full tank of gas? You're only paying three or four dollars more than you were before, or maybe you're paying five dollars more. What's what's five dollars? Now, from my position, that might $5 might not be a lot. For someone else who's barely struggling to pay to fill up their tank before, $5 might mean a lot more. So this, again, goes right to this next point of this sort of privileged or decontextualized positions, right? I can make these sort of objective statements, well, $5 isn't a lot of money. And I think objectively, it's not a lot of money. But at the same time, if, if, it's, if I'm in a position where $5 is the difference between eating tonight and not eating tonight, then yeah, actually, there is a certain amount of relativism to the value of that $5. Um, as Code notes, the relativism creates stringent accountability requirements. In other words, if I'm going to make a knowledge claim, I have to start taking into account these other aspects of how I'm acquiring that knowledge, of the presuppositions I'm bringing to my knowledge claims. So it turns out that relativism, by saying, look, there's a subjective element to knowledge, means that I, as the person making a knowledge claim, has to say, well, look, I'm also looking at this from, in my case, a white heterosexual male position. Why does that matter? Because it might matter how easily or easy it is for me to go get another job, say, right? Am I going to face the same challenges as somebody else who may not share these characteristics? So it makes it that, well, look, my knowledge claim really is a little more comp complex or complicated, and I can't oversimplify a situation. Well, the economy is good. Go, go get another job. That might not be true of everyone. So again, this privileged position, decontextualized, where you're not taking in to the context of I'm different or in a different position than others. It also, says Code, introduces a moral political component to the heart of epistemological inquiry. So there is a moral element. So as the examples I've given here, some of these examples, in fact, demonstrate that it's not the, the case that all knowledge claims. Now, we're not saying that there aren't knowledge claims that are purely objective in the sense of, you know, the rocks are 20 yards away or 30 yards away. We are saying, though, it seems to be that not all knowledge claims are purely empirical in that way, that there is a moral or political component that comes into making some or making certain claims. And just because there's no one way of explaining things, it doesn't mean that all ways of knowing are equally, equally valid. Some can be better than others. So code is acknowledging also that, look, even though relativism has these advantages, and it, one of the advantages to say that, look, you know, there are different ways of knowing things. There's different ways of perceiving things. 
That doesn't mean that they're all equally valid, though. So she shouldn't be, you shouldn't take code to say, ah, oh, well, everything's up for grabs and everything is relative. And it really does depend on where you're looking and where you're situated. Yes, in a lot of cases, but not every observation is going to be equally valid. Not every knowledge claim is going to be equally valid or way of explaining things, right? So in scientific explanation, it turns out my feelings about how fast an object falls to the earth are irrelevant. And it's not as good if I'm basing how fast I think something's falling as, as opposed to having standards of measurement where I actually measure the object and it's falling and say, oh, okay, Mark thinks that object is falling really fast or he's falling at you know, a certain 9.8 meters per second or 9.7 meters per second where somebody else thinks it's falling at 10. Well, you know, our feelings about or what we would like it to be, or I like to work in, you know, even numbers of 10 rather than something like 9.7. Well, I, it sh then objects should fall at 10. I'm just going to say they fall at 10. Well, of course, that's not as valid, right? So we can have standards of knowledge in some ways they are better than others, but relativism does remind us that there are multiple ways of viewing things. And in this instance, or in this case, then, the sex of the knower can be epist epistemically relevant. Right? So in certain cases, it matters who is doing the knowing. Right, S knows that P, who is S, will actually matter. And we're going to talk a little bit about, more about that as we go along here. So to build on what I've said already, um, the sex of the knower is one, says code, of a cluster of subjective factors. Um, so what it means to be a knower is in part influenced by the sex of the person doing the knowing. So it's something that is epistemically significant. So you can't just ignore the fact. Now you might be able to ignore the fact in certain situations. So I, I'm thinking here of the physical sciences, right? Observing how bodies move in space and certain you know laws at the subatomic level, but we should know that there are times when the sex of the knower does. So we know, for example, in medical research that male doctors are often more sub, um, um, dismissive of pain statements made by women. Doctors, in fact, male doctors will be more dismissive of symptoms or pain in all patients. So it turns out if you want doctors who are more um, acute in their diagnoses, it turns out that female doctors tend to do better at diagnosing problems than male doctors, mainly because they don't ignore certain symptoms that male doctors do. So it turns out there is actually a difference between having a male doctor and a female doctor in, in certain cases. Now, this isn't to say that all male doctors are one way and all female doctors are, are another way. It's just to say that on average, it turns out that um, female doctors tend to be more sensitive to symptoms that male doctors will, will dismiss as not important. Now this also, this, this view that the sex of the knower is part of a cluster of factors. Now remember, it's not the only factor, but it can be part of a cluster of factors. It doesn't commit us to subjectivism, right? So even if there is a subjective element, even if we know that you know, female doctors have a slightly different perspective when doing diagnoses, it doesn't mean that, of course, that's the only thing that will decide whether or not someone, a patient, actually has a particular condition. So it might be that that's one factor that might be relevant to knowledge that's obtained. On the other hand, there are tests, and there's going to be history, and there's going to be, you know, the, the various knowledge base that's already there about different conditions and um, um, what sort of uh, what sort of symptoms manifest themselves? So all that has to be taken into account. And those might be objective. It might be the case that no, this disease does not cause this type of symptom. But it does turn out that um, some of that might be partially subjective, right? Whether or not one picks up on a particular symptom and relates it to a particular disease might have a subjective element to it. Um, and specificities count, but they're not the whole story. Right, So the nature of the individual, the character of the individual doing the knowing might count. It might be an influence, but it's not the only thing. So we shouldn't interpret code as saying, oh, yes, it matters so much. It's the only thing that matters is the sex of the knower. When we talk about S knows that P, 
S is so important that if you know if we happen to know the sex of the knower is male and the sex of the knower is female, that's one of the, the most important things. And what she's saying is no, it's just one factor of many that leads us to particular statements, knowledge statements, right? That might have an influence on what counts as knowledge. So let's talk again, let's sort of build up on this knower and known, what they know, what they know, what, what the knower is and what it is they know. Traditional theories, Code points out, have this approach that is solitary, atomistic, and generally male. So if we look back even in our own readings, the majority of approaches that we've taken um, or that philosophers have taken are solitary. I mean, Descartes's a perfect example of this, right? This isn't about multiple perspectives or multiple reflections or how others also perceive the world and whether their dreams are just as vivid and whether they can doubt in this way and whether that acts, you know, they have the same sort of perceptions or the same sort of reflections. Um, so his is very solitary, right? The one individual. It's atomistic. And this is true of both Locke and Descartes and even Kant for that matter, is that we're talking about the atomistic individual, right? There's atomistic individuals not influenced by anyone else, almost like they came up fully formed and fully, you know, fully rational, and now they're making claims about things in the world. And it doesn't take into account the fact that other people raised them and um, presented the world to them in particular ways and gave them language and all these other things. So traditional theories tend to be this very male dominated atomistic and solitary kind of view of knowledge of the knower and what they know. Code's revision of this is to say, no, look, we are actually all embedded individuals. And all that means is that we are in relations to others, right? No one is born into a world as a purely solitary atomistic individual. Everyone has parents or a parent or someone who raised them, right? You're embedded in a community, generally some sort of family structure. Then outside of that, you've got your, you know, maybe your extended family or your, your community, and then your country, your state, country, and so forth, right? We're all embedded in these multiple layers of individuals. So there is no solitary atomistic individual. We're always, we always find ourselves in a particular context. There's a history, right? It's historical as well, right? We are not only embedded in communities, but these communities come with a history. So just simply ask yourself, what sort of beliefs did you grow up with? What sort of political views? What sort of views about the world or what was important or what sort of things you should attempt to achieve and what things weren't worth attempting achieving and all those sorts of things. And notice that all of those come from this embeddedness, right? We're in these cultural circumstances, Code mentions. Look, there's different cultures with different traditions. Again, this all sort of, you can see how these all sort of go together, is that not only is there a history to where I've come from and the history that of where I'm embedded, but there are different cultural circumstances which give direction and a view of how the world is. Then there's character, right? So individual character can also influence our view of the world and also our interpretation of it, right? So if we're a person who believes we have obligations to others, that's going to influence our assessment of someone's behavior, right? If someone doesn't take proper care for others, we'll make certain claims and say that person is a bad person or they're an uncaring person or they're a cold person. Well, if I'm making a claim that I think is essentially a knowledge claim, right? It, it might have a moral component to it, but it also might be look, that's just what we mean by a cold person. Notice that's going to be influenced by all of these other factors, right? By my character, what I believe is, you know, good character traits, as well as um, my evaluation of someone else's traits. Um, and character itself can influence your view. Um, and also, of course, your interests, right? What things you are interested in, what things hold your interest, what things you pay attention to, as opposed to the things you don't pay attention to. So, Human beings, knowers, the S knows that P, we S's, does that make sense? We S's, I guess that sounds right. The S's of the world are not like they're described in traditional theories. We're actually much more complicated than that, right? There's a lot more going on. And sometimes we, you know, as Code would acknowledge, sometimes we have to get past 
our cultural, historical, or embedded circumstances in order to make accurate knowledge claims. Other times, though, that embeddedness, that history, those circumstances, character, and interest, and so forth might actually help make clearer the truth of a situation, right? We might actually be able to get to um, truth better by acknowledging that human beings are, in fact, made up in this way, right? We're not these solitary atomistic individuals. Now, one of the things that Code wants to be very clear is that when she says that, there, that the sex of the knower is relevant, she doesn't want to say that there is a particularly feminine or masculine way of looking at the world. So a feminine epistemology would argue that men and women have certain essential differences. Code does not believe this. So Code isn't saying that there's a fundamental difference between the way men and women perceive the world in the sense of we're sort of biologically wired to view the world in one way or another. Male ways of knowing, she says, are not monolithic for one thing. So if you tried to make this distinction and say, well, men think one way, women, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, right? And there's a supposedly this, you know, fundamentally we're different beings in this way. And Coe says no, because look, first of all, there isn't a male, quote unquote, way of knowing any more than there's a female way of knowing. And I think we would chalk up any of those differences to actually the way in which we're raised. There's plenty of things that influence um, male ways and female ways that are just socially constructed, right? Oh, men are supposed to be tough. Uh, they're supposed to be unemotional. Women are more caring. They're more nurturing. Well, is that really true? Or is that something that one's been raised to believe, right? Oh, men are aggressive. Women are not as aggressive. You know, I say, oh, see that. Now, is that because naturally men are more aggressive than women? Is that a, a biological fact? Or are we saying, no, 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 you've been sort of enculturated into believing that males are a certain way and females. One of the statements I hate is boys will be boys. What the hell does that mean, right? You say, well, wait a minute. What do you mean boys will be boys? Boys are the way they're raised. If they're raised to be a certain way, that's the way they're going to be. And if they're raised to be another way, those are the values and the character traits that they're going to um, instantiate. Right? And so you say, no, it's, it's not about that. So she rejects this idea that there, because one, she can just point to the world and say, look, there's actually not one male way of viewing things and a female way of, view, of viewing things. And further, to sort of build on that same point, the notion of feminine and masculine itself are not rigid across time. So even if you wanted to say that there's a feminine and a masculine view, right, that there's something essentially different in this way, you would have to then look at history and say, look, historically, what characteristics were considered feminine and which were masculine aren't rigid across time. They change, right? What's What it means to be masculine or male in, in one century can be completely different than another or can or have variations across. So she says, no, what I'm not arguing here is that the sex of the knower is relevant in the sense that it's biologically predetermined in some way. That's not her claim. Her claim is going to be something more along the lines that because of the unique experiences men and women have in societies, that that gives them a perspective that hopefully comes to a more complete notion of the truth. In other words, if I only view the world from my one perspective, from my white male perspective, then it turns out I might be ignoring what it's like to live in a world if I were a black female, right? That's going to be a very different way. There's going to be a different set of data that they will have that I don't. And so part of coming to the truth, you know, it's funny to use that in quotes, the truth is going to come from acknowledging that there are these multiple perspectives that we need to take into account in order to come to a to say that we know something, whatever that P is. S knows that P, well, S, I have to acknowledge that maybe there are others who have perspectives that have knowledge, that have data they can bring in that's going to actually more accurately reflect what P is, what the truth is. Now, a lot of what this then boils down to, what code is attempting to sort of do is talk about social epistemology, that really this applies more to 
questions of social, political um, notions rather than the sort of hardcore scientific empiricism that we've talked about. So what social epistemology does is it investigates the epistemic effects of social interactions and social systems. So it turns out that what a, a social truth is, what a truth about the world from a social standpoint, and this could be social, political, sort of ethical, is a lot of ways influenced by the perspective of the person um, within that social system, right? And I don't think this is particularly controversial, right? If you've never experienced extreme poverty or hunger, or you've never been someone who's lived on the street, you probably have a different view of our system of capitalism, of a market-based economy, of a social safety net than someone who's actually lived under those conditions. So something that you and I might take for granted is not something that someone from a, who has this different perspective takes for granted. So the truth about how good or bad, for example, an economy is, might be a combination of not only those who are very wealthy, those who make their money off the stock market or off their dividends or their investments, along with those who are wage workers, those who are hourly workers, and maybe those who are homeless or those who are on the street, right? All of those perspectives matter. And it also matters whether you're male or female, right? That's going to matter because women's perspective on the job market, women right now believe it's something like 82 cents on the dollar. They earn 82 cents on the dollar for every dollar a man earns. Well, look, if I go to a company and I get a job or I come to the university and I apply for a job and they offer me a certain amount of money and I say yes, I can just assume, well, anyone else working here is also probably making the same amount of money I am to do the same job when they're hired at the same time. And it turns out, no, that's actually not the case. Well, how would I know that? I would only know that if we take into account the perspective of other individuals. So feminist epistemology can be viewed as a refinement of this social epistemology. So when I'm looking at the effects of social systems, of could be economic systems, um, even ethical systems, it might be that, look, I have failed to take into account these other perspectives, and this helps refine my epistemology. So to give another example, you might say, well, look, we all have the same work day. So say you have an eight hours, five days a week, the standard 40-hour work week, and anything above that's overtime. And you say, what's wrong with that? Everyone, it applies to everyone. It applies equally. Everyone knows what it means to go into the workforce. But here's something we often ignore. When you have a work day that starts somewhere between 8 and 8.30 for most people and ends at 5, but you have a school system where school might not start till 8.30 and is over by 3 or 3.30. Well, okay, what happens to the children in that situation? Well, for most men, it's not even a thought. And for most bosses, we'll say, look, I, I don't care what's happening with your kids because I'm assuming you have a, a spouse who's taking care of it or you have daycare or you have you know extended family that's doing it. But notice that 40-hour work week was really a work week that presupposed that there was somebody there for the children. Now, you might say, well, you don't have to have children, of course, but businesses want us to have children. Why? Because they need more workers and they need more people to buy their stuff. So presumably, we know that people have children and we want people to have children, but we've created a system where if you look at it from one perspective, it looks fine. Well, five days a week, 40 hours a week, get the weekends off. I work from 8.30 to 5 or 9 to 5. What's the problem? And the problem is that we haven't taken into account a system that doesn't, say, provide flex time for parents to go get their kids after school or doesn't have daycare built in or assumes that there is affordable daycare or family members that can watch kids or older siblings. Of course, those older siblings had to get there by somebody watching them and so forth. So you can see how different perspectives might say, well, the truth of the situation is yeah, it's a lot harder for certain workers, single parents, whether they're male or female. Single parents have a lot harder time in the job and the ability to change jobs and the ability to give up a job with certain benefits to take on an, another job that might have more potential because we're only looking at it from the perspective of someone who, say, doesn't have children or someone who has a spouse who's staying home or who has extended grandparents or someone who can watch the kids, right? And those things all influence what we consider to be the truth of 
a particular situation or what we know about a particular social system. So we should note that the difference between the nature of knowledge and knowledge construed more broadly. So the idea of knowledge, S knows that P, but also we should be thinking of knowledge in this broader context where to say that one knows something is to know it with all of these other considerations in mind. Now, as, as you're probably thinking, this obviously doesn't necessarily apply to all epistemic statements. And code fully acknowledges that, right? She's saying, look, just like we said before, sex can be just one factor in determining the truth of a situation. That S knows that P, and to say that one has knowledge of a situation, that might just be one aspect. So if I could say, do I know that one society is better than another, that one sort of uh, set of social systems are better than some other social system. Well, the way I can truly know whether one is better than the other is one, I would have to, of course, have some agreed upon criteria, but two, even that criteria itself would have to take the perspective of more than just one privileged sort of standpoint, right? It would have to take into account all these other views. And then we can actually say with a little more certainty that S knows that P because S is now taking into account all of these other things. So while well, initially, when you look at someone like Code's work, if we're if we're looking at a situation of, you know, when someone says, well, is the sex of the knower um, epistemo epistemologically significant? You might say, yeah, actually it is. Although our first instinct might be to say, well, no, of course not. But remember, Code is sort of going beyond just sort of brute facts about the world. She's saying that the person viewing certain facts, um, their position, their perspective, um, the context in which that knowing is taking place can actually matter. And again, with the hope that we come to sort of a big T truth, right? That it's not just my view or just one perspective, but that when you sort of put all of those perspectives together, you come to an actual truth about a situation. And generally, as Coates said, this is social epistemology that we're talking about. Note also, and just as, as I finish here, that this is in, in some ways very close to Bertrand Russell's notion. So if you add to Bertrand Russell a social component, a social epistemic component, you see that Russell says, well, how do I know that Niagara Falls is there? How do I know that there's an external world, right? And, and Russell says, well, look, you go there and you look at it and you describe a, a particular um, perception and then other people come to that approximate thing and they see approximately the same thing. And it turns out that when you have all these perspectives, you can be pretty sure that what they all sort of intersect and agree on is actually the truth. Yes, in fact, there's a there's something Niagara Falls there, that it exists, it exists independently of me, and that it has certain characteristics and features. Well, why not extend that to this sort of question as well? When I'm making statements, particularly statements about social systems and structures, it's quite possible that if once I've taken into account these multiple perspectives, that I'm actually more likely to come to the truth about a situation, what the actual nature of the world is, that more accurately describes the world by having these multiple perspectives. And one of the things that's going to matter is who's doing the perceiving, right? Whether that person is living in the world who's male or female in the case of codes. And I think we can extend this too. She, I, I believe she would be fine with extending this to, well, you could change this to race, right? Sexual orientation. These are all different epistemic things that might be relevant. Again, they're not the only thing that's relevant, but they are going to be relevant in making certain claims about the nature of the world or the nature of certain social structures.